Okay, here, let's go. Okay, welcome to our first narrated PowerPoint. If the audio is a little muffled, I apologize. Um, the room I'm, I'm currently in has quite the echo, and I hope to record these in the future in a better place where the echo isn't as bad and the AC unit doesn't run um, as loudly. So in this PowerPoint, we'll discuss Chapter 1, an introduction to the paralegal profession. Um, some of you may be working paralegals and you have a very good idea of what your job responsibilities are. Um, other folks in the class may have signed up for this course to figure out exactly what a paralegal does in the daily course of their job. So we'll go through some of the things you might uh, find yourself doing once you're out of our program and employed as a paralegal. Often a definition you'll find in textbooks talks about folks that are qualified by education, training, or work experience um, who are employed by lawyers and law firms, corporations, uh, by way of in-house counsel, government agencies, or, or other entities that utilize legal services. And these folks perform work that's been delegated to them by a supervising attorney of a, of a substantive nature. So they are paraprofessionals doing legal work under the supervision of attorney. Um, and sort of the, the new approach of, of maybe a ladder within a firm, if you will, of, of an entry level um, clerking, reception job, leads to legal secretary, um, leads to paralegal, then maybe a supervising paralegal in that order. Um, quite a few paralegals go to law school. In fact, Professor Sandag started out as a paralegal for three or four years before going to law school. Also, one thing important to note is historically, most paralegals were trained, like lawyers were trained back in the day, through work experience and training. Um, formal education programs only really started in the latter half of the 20th century. L law schools, of course, predate that um, pretty significantly, but today there are still a number of, of paralegals working out there who do not have a paralegal degree or certificate. They received all their education and training within a firm. Um, in a lot of jurisdictions, legal assistant is used interchangeably with paralegal. This goes for Florida as well. Um, you'll see jobs advertised for legal assistants um, where the job responsibilities look a lot like a paralegal job and vice versa. Even our own program is marketed sometimes as legal assisting slash paralegal program. My personal preference is, is to move the title of the profession to paralegal. Uh, I see legal assisting as more of a secretar secretarial administrative position, paralegal as a paraprofessional position. So what do they do? Well, that really depends on the firm. So the diverse range of activities paralegals may be engaged in. Whatever they're doing, of course, must be under the supervision of an attorney and is supporting legal services. So everything from intake interviews, initial interviews with clients, uh, document preparation, working on trial notebooks and exhibits for trials. Um, of course, the workload and responsibilities will look a lot different in a litigation firm that handles insurance defense compared to a probate estate planning firm that does um, a lot of document preparation and review. Some paralegals analyze legal materials for internal use. They draft things like legal memorandums, collect and analyze data, and also, also create materials uh, for the general public's use. If you have a, a background already 
in um, a, field, a field like nursing or accounting, maybe something very niche like business management, retail management, restaurant management. There are firms out there that can utilize your expertise in those areas. So you can imagine a firm that does personal injury being very excited about a paralegal coming in who has prior work experience in the medical field because they'll be able to assist in analyzing and interpreting medical records. Um, but if you don't possess those sort of hard skills that formal training uh, gives you, please rest assured that any soft skills you bring to this profession are sought after as well. So the ability to, to be an active listener, to be engaged in a conversation, to ask probing questions and, and questions that lead to um, thoughtful answers is important. Uh, being able to write is crucially important. So within our program, you will take two writing classes where you'll learn things like citation. And hopefully you've picked up on grammar and punctuation and other writing and English classes. Some of the skills paralegals need look a lot like skills that lawyers need. So being resourceful, persevering, being able to think through things analytically, and also um, having empathy and sensitivity towards your clients. Um, some of the clients will, are coming to you in their, their, their greatest moment of need, in their most vulnerable moment. And while it may be a routine um, I don't know, family matter to you, for instance, if it's a divorce case or a pretty typical criminal charge, if you do criminal defense, to that client, it's their entire you know, livelihood, perhaps, their, their liberty and freedom, their family at stake, their business, perhaps. So we often meet with clients and deal with clients in their most, most vulnerable capacity. Um, you've started in on the program at a time where the job outlook is, is pretty solid. Um, there are a lot of statistics out there, both state level and federal. Um, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics have, has updated the outlook. Um, it's still relatively strong. Um, at a while, for a while, it was going at a pretty uh, aggressive clip of, of growth, 12, 14, 15 percent in some states. I think typically the federal numbers now across the na nation show growth in the field anywhere between 8 and 12 percent. So there will be jobs created, not just jobs where we're, we're filling in for retired folks, but Firms are expanding on the number of paralegals they're hiring as, um, well, just candidly, they're hiring fewer attorneys and they're hiring more um, support personnel. To give you some numbers that your textbook does not have, as far as Florida goes, the, um, the number of paralegals in the state are 21,000 strong. That number will incre increase you know, five, eight, maybe even 10% a year for the next decade or so. Um, we'll talk a little in a little bit about the registered paralegal program in the state. Um, there are 3,800 registered paralegals since the Supreme Court of Florida has adopted that program. Uh, folks always want to know about income potential. And within the law, tracking incomes can be a little tricky because the legal field is separated into private practice sectors, and private sector. Um, let me start over. The income field is separated in public and private sectors. So working for a state agency, a federal agency, a local government, in those public sector jobs, incomes are typically lower, but benefits, um, pension plans, fringe benefits are often higher. In the private sector, you go work for a private law firm, a private corporation in their legal department, and the salaries are typically higher. So this 2011 average of $46,711 is across the state. So from Miami to Tallahassee, 
and it brings in both public sector worker, workers and private sector workers of all experience levels. So take the number with a, a grain of salt. We have had graduates get their first job making $45,000 a year. We had one last year, I know for a fact, started at $45,000. We've also had graduates go to the state and start at $28,000 working with the state attorney's office. So just to give you an idea, the numbers are really all over the place. The national outlook, if you're someone that has some mobility and could potentially move, um, these numbers are a little bit stronger than the state numbers. You'll see the median pay for 2015 is, is 48000 810. Um, I have friends that have firms in the Midwest who pay their paralegals over $50,000. That's a pretty good salary in Ohio or Indiana where the cost of living is lower than even Florida. The entry-level education needed um, typically is an associate's degree. You see a lot of bachelor's programs popping up. Um, I'm all for more education, but please know to enter the, the profession, uh, an associate's degree or, an, or a certificate, if you already have a bachelor's degree, is more than adequate. Um, job numbers across the country, 280,000, give or take, in 2014. The job outlook from 2014 to 2024 is that 8%. And you're looking at plus 21,200 jobs in that decade. So while this growth is not you know, super strong, um, the profession is not losing jobs either. It's, it's gaining jobs at a, at a modest pace. We can drill down a little bit into Florida salaries. Folks are typically um, interested in these things. And you can look by metro area the number of paralegals employed, and then the average salary. And you'll see some divergence here, especially, say, um, you know, Miami compared to, to our area. Um, 10,000 uh, paralegals in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, compared to you know, 510 in Tallahassee, um, 1,600 in Jacksonville. 32.80 in Orlando, and then Tampa, 44.90. So right now you're in the second largest labor market for paralegals in the state. If you're going to move to one of these other metro areas, just be mindful that with fewer jobs, you'll probably face much more competition. There are a lot of programs around the country. Many of you have probably investigated online and on site and hybrid options, certificate, associate degree programs, bachelor's degrees. There's even master's degrees programs in paralegal education now. Um, we offer both an AS degree and a certificate program. You must have a bachelor's degree to qualify for the certificate program. Um, if you want to go on, with a bachelor, bachelor's degree in paralegal studies. Uh, St. Pete College has that program. Um, there are a few others across the state that we have articulation agreements with, but I'm here to tell you, you know, you'll do fine with your AS or your certificate finding a job. The, the, the state of affairs with employment for paralegals right now is AS and certificates are entry level. It's great later on if you can pick up the bachelor's degree, have your employer maybe pay for you to go back to school, but don't feel like that's a necessity to, uh, to enter the profession. One thing to please note on our program with our classes is we've tried to really diversify our offerings. We have really a wide range of distance learning or online classes now available. Our goal is to have all of our core classes online by next spring, allowing you to take you know, this intro class towards your writing, 
I already teach real estate, probate, um, business organizations online. If you're in the certificate program, you'll have the potential, if you like to take classes online, to take every required class online. Also, many of our electives are offered online. So things like ethics and, and my real estate two class and family law are online offerings as well. The area that I ventured into that I think we're having a lot of success with are hybrid classes. Classes that meet one day a week on campus and then the rest of the week you have some online activities or assessments. I'm currently teaching two of those this semester and going forward I'll continue to teach more and more classes that way just to allow for some flexibility. The same goes for um, our electives. We've added more electives and we'll be cycling electives um, going forward in academic years. So things like immigration law, sports and entertainment, special seminars, um, those are all now in the books um, that you'll have an opportunity to take just to give you uh, my, more diversity and exposure to the types of law that are out there. Some programs are ABA approved. We are actually approved by the American Association for Paralegal Education, which is known as AFPI. AFPI follows the ABA guidelines. Um, the ABA is, is the bar association for the country. Um, they're more concentrated on, on um, regulating lawyers, while AFPI, the American Association for Paralegal Education, is in business strictly for paralegal education. And so that's whose guidelines we fall, fall under. We have a number of required courses. I've already talked about uh, a few of them, like torts and legal writing, to give you a really strong foundation. You know, hopefully this intro class gives you a pretty good introduction to the law. After you've fulfilled those, you know, be sure to take a, a number of different types of specialty courses so you can explore different areas of the law. That may help you with your career planning if you're not currently working in a firm or if you don't really know what area of the law you want to work in once you graduate. We all understand that computer skills are important. Technology is just the way of the world. The legal field has been kind of slow to catch up with leveraging technology. But over the last decade, um, the court systems and private firms have done a much better job bringing technology to the forefront. You'll find that most jurisdictions now for a number of years have had e-filing and e-discovery. It was just in the news here this last month, here in May of, uh, I guess it was in April of 2017, that the second DCA will have has expanded its electronic filing. So it's just the way of the world. Um, we have a number of classes that teach legal computer skills, and you learn computer research in both Legal Writing 1 and Legal Writing 2. One area where there's a lot of confusion is with, with certified paralegal status. So currently there are four national exams for people to choose from. Um, in Florida, the CLA is slash CP, Certified Paralegal Exam, is probably the most popular one. Um, this is offered by the National Association of Legal Assistance, or NALA. There's also the PACE exam offered by the National Federation of Paralegal Associations and the PCC. I know this is turning into a bunch of alphabet you know, soup here with all these acronyms. Um, these are standalone certifications offered by different organizations. They are different from Florida's registered paralegal program. They all have merit. They all can potentially help you and boost you know, your um, job potential 
and um, your strength strength going out there into the workplace seeking a job, um, we're sort of entrenched with and work closely with the National Association of Legal Assistants, NALA, and we will be putting in place a prep program for graduates who want to take the CLA CP exam, the Certified Paralegal exam. It'll be a free program as far as the prep goes. You'll have to pay for the examination, but it will allow graduates of HCC's paralegal program after they have achieve their certificate or their AS degree to then take the CP exam within six months of graduation. Florida also has a certified paralegal program. So the Florida uh, certified paralegal exam. To qualify for this, paralegals must already be NALA certified. So this is sort of a lattice approach to credentialing. Um, you have to have a certificate or a degree to sit for the NALA CP, Certified Paralegal Exam. Then you can take the FCP. Let me just pause right here and state for the record, these are not requirements for a job. They are not comparable to taking the bar exam for a lawyer. They are just ways to be recognized and certified within the profession. Florida also registers paralegals through um, the Florida Supreme Court and the Florida State Bar. So it's a voluntary registration program where there's eligibility requirement through Rule 20 of the Florida Supreme Court rules. So in order to register as a Florida registered paralegal, and I know this is getting confusing, but um, you know, please spend some time maybe checking out the Florida registered paralegal program on the Florida Bar website. Um, you know, you'll be able to see the qualifications regarding education experience to be a Florida registered paralegal. Um, you have to already be certified to qualify under this program as well. So in our ethics chapter, we talk a lot about the un unauthorized practice or unlicensed practice of law and the dangers that exist. Um, regulating paralegals is a very hot topic across the country. In some jurisdictions, there's been a lot of movement with talk of licensing paralegals. Some jurisdictions, because of expanding the work that paralegals can now do, have put licensing requirements in place. So the best example of this is the state of Washington. Washington offers um, what is known as a legal, or I'm sorry, a limited legal license technician, LLLT. These are paralegals that can go to court under certain circumstances. I think right now it's just limited to family law. Because they're expanding the type of authorized work paralegals can do, they are really tightening sort of the requirements and putting in a licensing structure. Florida is a long way away from doing this, but it's just something to be mindful of that could come down the line later on, potentially um, during your career as a paralegal. So uh, you really need to begin setting goals for yourself, um, exploring different areas of the law, assessing your skills, seeing where your interests are, um, taking inventory of your prior work experience so that you can select electives and think about things like our internship program when it comes time to make those decisions that will align with where you want to be a year, two years, three years from now um, as far as being a paralegal. Um, the time in the program is going to move, move rather quickly, 
Um, there'll probably be opportunities for job shadowing. We have an internship program that you can participate in. And having already set goals, um, you'll be able to figure out what best fits your needs going forward. Okay, well, that's sort of the introduction um, to the course there with Chapter 1. Uh, hopefully this, this brief PowerPoint gave you some information, some things that um, aren't in the textbook regarding, you know, sort of the Florida job outlook. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to email me. Um, you know, we can even make a discussion topic um, of a question you have. Um, so that's it for today. Next Wednesday, we'll move on to Chapter 2. I'll have a, a new PowerPoint to post and um, you know, try to, to read maybe before you watch these. That way, the slides will make a little bit more sense and you can take notes and then clarify things after you're done viewing the, uh, the narrated PowerPoint. So um, I will talk at you all later on. Have a great week.